checking out round three of the World Enduro Championships at Semili in the Czech Republic. We'll also visit round four at puy en velay in the sunny central massif of France. Then we'll witness the euphoric incompetence of round one of the 1997 Off-Road Challenge, the inaugural 12-hour Enduro Pannonia Ring from Savar in Hungary. In addition, we'll preview and give you some information on the upcoming Erzberg spectacle of the Pikes Peak and Hare Scramble in Austria. And finally, we'll up the pace by visiting the famous road racing circuit of Hockenheim in Germany to take a look at the stars of the international supermoto scene, dealing with one another, sometimes a little unkindly. And since our off-road magazine service numbers have been changed, at the end of our show, we will be giving you our new numbers and we'll be telling you when our next programme will be and what you can expect to see. But first, those World Enduro Championships. Round three in Semily in the Czech Republic near to the Polish border and at the foot of the giant mountains. Here at the junction of three nations is traditional Enduro country. There are many, many legends about this region. It's said, for example, that during the famous International Six Days, trial, days Trials of the 50s and the 60s, spare parts for the Czech national team seemed to grow on trees. Certainly, the uh, then Eastern Bloc Czech, Czechoslovakian teams were fantastically su su successful on their CZ machines. And uh, here we have mainly KTMs, the Austrian KTMs, Husqvarna's, Huserbergs, Italian TMs, amongst the crews taking off on Saturday, day one, with 190 miles of rough terrain on each day, 138 contestants and intermittent rain to make things just a trifle sticky. One challenge of many, a mud hole like this. Many, of course, lose time, rack up penalty points. This is Mario Rinaldi riding in the 400 four-stroke class. He doesn't waver, rides his way through to his fifth consecutive victory. That means in the 400 class, he's won all races this season, is way out in front in the World Championship table. Local hero, hero Pomhumil Poslibny, took off to a bad start on his 500 four-stroke in the championship series, but here on his home turf he shows what he's got to take second. Anders Ericsson, practicing hard as possible on every kind of terrain, and picks up his first 500 victory of his career. Fabio Farioli has also started to get back into the swing of things after a recent operation on his shoulder. He takes third place. Harry Tynan, leader in the World Championship Series, but the Finn is having a poor day today. On one stage, his kickstand pops down and he loses 20 seconds, and besides that, nothing seems to go right either. Fourth place. But World Champion Peter Janssen wants the deputies to give him a hand. He's an off-road VIP after all, though strangely enough, it's usually the Swedes who insist that in assistance from the sidelines ought to be grounds for disqualification. Today, fifth place for Janssen, while Stefano Passeri has an easier time on his 125. Third place for him in the 125 class. Shane Watts, the Australian. Having a hard time with mud. He spent last winter practicing to get better at mud holes, but in this particular instance, it doesn't pay off. And his string of victories ends abruptly with a fourth place. The rest of the pack attempting to pick their way through the mud hole. The problem is, of course, the more you rev them, if you're at a standstill, the deeper they get. And here's a surprise. Stefan Peter Hansel, many people's best all-round motorcyclist in the world, caught in a rare, awkward moment on camera. When was the last time that great master took a tumble for us? And indeed, we catch another undignified moment for Stefan Peter Hansel, the famous Frenchman. Today, however, despite his falls, he takes his second victory in the 250 class. This is Giovanna Sala managing not to take a tumble today, but nevertheless the Italian can't beat Peter Hansel and finishes second. Elsewhere, there's a heated battle on Fausto Scavoli, who ends up winning, meets up with Passeri here in a somewhat undignified moment. And this is a wicked climb out of the woods, testing some of the lesser men, as well as the good ones, in this World Enduro field. 
Results of day one see Scavoli win the 125s from uh, Sweden's Rickard Larsson and Italy's Stefano Pazzeri. Peter Hansel takes the 250s ahead of Giovanna Sala and Frenchman Eric Bernard. Mario Rinaldi picks up the 400 four strokes from Laurent Buffiol and the great Laurent Pidou, former supermoto star. Anders Eriksson of Sweden on the Husqvarna picks up the 500 four strokes ahead of Posledny and Fabio Farioli. Day two and part of the special stage is actually a former ski jumping ramp. Bjorn Carlsen takes third place today in the 400cc Falklands four stroke class. While well, second place goes to Ottokar Kortbar, another of the loudly cheered Czechs. Laurent Pidou, the six foot four inch French giant running second in the table, only manages to take fifth today, however. While well, Mario Rinaldi once again shows how it's done. Sixth victory in a row in the small four stroke class, and he leads the table with the maximum number of points possible, 120. Anders Eriksson takes second today and narrows the gap to the leader in the table, Tynan, to a mere three points. Harry Tyne and once again takes a disappointing fourth place. It's common knowledge that the Finn isn't too keen on mud. Besides that, he's currently living mostly in Spain, and like he says himself, he doesn't get much opportunity to practice in these kinds of conditions. Paul Humil Posledny improves his result from day one, taking victory in his class. Terrific support from the Czech crowds as he climbs up the table from 11th to 5th position. In the 125 class, the junior Swede Rickard Larsson takes third. Fauscus Fausto Scavoli, the reigning world champion in the 125 class, takes second. And in the table, he moves up to second also. And it's Shane Watts who proves today that he really did spend the winter practicing in muddy conditions. He takes the first victory of his career on muddy stuff and his fifth victory, fifth victory of the season. The junior does indeed have the potential to become a future superstar. And in the 250 class, a man who already is, Stefan Peter Hansel, takes second today and moves up to within five points of title leader Sala. The next round, of course, will take place on the Frenchman's home soil. Giovanna Sala is out in front at this point, but only with a one second lead of Peter Hansel as he comes over the ramp. And then on the very last special stage, just a few meters before the finishing time, he takes a cruel fall. How's that for that for getting hooked off your bike? Let's take another look at it. And that's what happens when you jump just a bit too high and a bit too far when there are overhanging trees. Absolutely, instantly fetched off his bike and Sala lost it to Peter Hansel at that moment. Pateri Silvan also profits with his first victory. That's all for round three of the World Championships in the Czech Republic. Results after the two days. First place in the 1 2s five for Shane Watts, ahead of Scavoli and Ricard Larsen. Pateri and the KTM down in fourth place. 250s winner, Silvan Pateri. Peter Hansel second, Sala third after that dramatic get-off. The 400 four strokes, a win for Mario Rinaldi. Ottokar Kotzbar of Czechol second on the Husqvarna. Bjorn Carlsen third on the Husaberg. Posledny wins the uh, 500s, the big boy four strokes, ahead of Eriksson and Katrinak with Tainan tailing off in fourth place. We go on now to puy en velay close to clermont Ferrand in the Massif Central, in the centre of France. A beautiful part of the country, this, as the Enduro teams gather for uh, what should prove to be another fairly hectic and at times sticky experience. There's been a lot of rain around here. Stefan Peter Hansel lovingly preparing his Yamaha. Lots of KTMs, they feature very, very strongly on the enduro scene. Four stroke and two stroke. There's been a lot of rain here despite the sunshine now, so we're expecting things to be pretty sticky. 150 miles of riding on the first day, 126 riders. And in the 500 class, Kari Tainan is ready and eager to make up for missed opportunities in the Czech Republic. Today he is the first to come to the special stages, but he actually ends up taking second place in the 500 four-stroke class. Fabio Ferroli still feeling the pain from that shoulder, but he remains steady to take third place as he did in the Czech Republic. 
Anders Eriksson, perfect ride, taking victory the first day, advancing into the up the table into a point tie with Tainan, while in the 125 class world champ Fausto Scavoli may have been able to beat the newcomer Watts in the Czech Republic once, but today has to settle for third again. Newcomer Ricard Larsen is also improving, he takes second, he's got potential, while the old champ Stefano Passeri drops back to fifth place. Shane Watts takes victory number six out of seven races, and that despite several hard crashes, because he's a pretty hard rider. And you can see the amount of rainfall we've had from the, uh, the fact that the rivers are running pretty high and some of the river crossings are getting pretty deep. In the 250 class, Eric Bernard started the season off strongly. He suffered some setbacks, but seems to be back on the winning track, finishes second today. Behind him, coming in third, Giovanna Sala, who is handicapped by that crash in the Czech Republic. Team boss Farioli is on edge, but there's nothing he can do about it. It was a sure thing that Peter Hansler was going to put on the pressure here in France, and he takes victory easily today, and is now tied with Sala at the top of the table. Strangely enough, one thing that uh, Stefan Peter Hansel hasn't won is a World Enduro Championship. In the 400 class, Christian Boulet, third in last season's World Championship, first race of this year, third. Laurent Pidou, he earned penalty points at the start in the Czech Republic, but he finishes second today and hoists himself second into the, in the table. Mario Rinaldi, his seventh victory out of seven races. In the table, he's got a large margin of 39 points advantage now. The bad look of the last two years, when he missed the title by one miserly point, doesn't look likely to repeat itself for the Italian. So, the results of the first day, the 125 class, Shane Watts of Australia on top again on the KTM, ahead of Larson's Susquehanna and Scavoli's Yamaha. Stefan Peter Hansel on the Yamaha heads the 250s, ahead of Bernard and Sala pushed down into third place by the two Frenchmen. Mario Rinaldi tops the 404 strokes from Pidu Susquehanna and Christian Boulot's KTM. Anders Eriksson on top where he belongs on the Husqvarna ahead of Kari Tainan, the Finnish KTM and Fabio Farioli on the Italian KTM. Day two sees a fast cross-country test through dense woods, very demanding of skill and of courage. When you've got trees this close near to you, you bet it needs courage. Fiber class, Farioli claims that he only rides 90 degrees on dangerous stages like these. Uh, fourth on, to, on this day's performance. I uh, don't blame him for only going 90%. Peter Janssen, reigning world champ, improves to third and fourth place in the table. But Anders Eriksson has to settle for second today. He loses three points at the top of the table. Considering this is the Swedes' first year riding the 500 class, however, he's not doing badly, and he's turning out to be a serious threat to Kari Tainan, who shows the competition who's boss to take his fifth victory of the season. It's tough living up to being a five times world champion, though. The fi everyone expects the Finn to win every time he goes out, so second place is a bit like you've failed, and fifth, of course, is a total disaster. In the 125 class, Fausto Scavoli takes third again. Ricard Larsen takes second again. And Shane Watts takes his wild seventh victory of the season. He really is a look at this broadside past the trees. He's a wild kid, Shane Watts. Just wait till he gets his style ironed out and see how quick he'll be then. Christian Boulet takes fourth place in the 400 class. The Frenchman is riding the finest machine in his class. Modern technical features, everything held together with lightweight aluminium screws, except it looks like a, a flapping um, a flapping exhaust system. Better get a few screws into that, Christian. Laurent Pidou, loudly cheered hero, third today, despite his bad luck in the Czech Republic, still holding a strong second in the table. The former supermoto star, Tall and of the indeed Grand Prix motocrosser once upon a time used to specialize in mega crashes. Bjorn Carlson takes second place in the board at four strokes. Rinaldi knows that this man is to be taken seriously. He found that out the hard way when Carlson snuck in between Ericsson and Rinaldi in the finals and ruined things for the Italian. No danger apparent this time round, however. Rinaldi takes his eighth victory out of eight races and is way out front in the table with three rounds left. 
the 250 class, Eric Bernard crashes out heavily on another stage today and is unable to repeat, yes, repeat, repeat yesterday's good result. Finishes sixth. She's also hurt it because of the lost points due to a retirement in Portugal with a broken swing arm and those are the sort of breaks, unfortunately, a prototype test rider can suffer. Giovanni Sali roaring through the woods. His riding style may be a little rough around the edges, but he makes up for his, for his no fear, no mentality. Still, no matter how hard he pushes, it's not enough to make Sala number one. He only finishes third today. But look how quick he is. Petri Silvan takes second place, and in the table, he's now running third. The rounds in Scandinavia, which are to come, will determine whether or not he's world championship potential. Stefan Peter Hansel on home territory. He takes victory by a wide margin, thus pulling away from Sala in the table. For the first time, he's got the best chance of a World Championship Enduro crown. He's won the Dakar Rally five, four or five times. He's won the Atlas Rally. He's run just about everything except the World Enduro title. And the fans think that this could be his turn. So, Shane wants to take the one to take the one, two, fives once more ahead of Ricard Larson and Fausto Scavoli. 250s are headed by that scalding performance of Peter Hansel's ahead of Vittori Silvan and Giovanni Sala. Once again reduced to third place, Rinaldi takes the 400 four strokes ahead of Carlson and Laurent Pidou and Christian Boulou. And the 500 four strokes are led at this time by Kari Tainer, turning the tables on Anders Eriksson and Peter Janssen, with Fabio Fariola fourth. So, join us again for more action from the Off-Road Challenge in a couple of minutes. So we kick off second half of our program with round one of the 12 hour enduro Pannonia ring. <laughs> round one of our 1997 off-road challenge. And we're going to see some pretty spectacular, if, uh, if at times rather perplexing action and in inertia indeed here. These guys, well, if off-road biking is all about uh, skillful throttle control and caressing the clutch, you won't see it very much around these parts. This is the Pannonia Ring in Sava in Hungary. It was only completed in 1996, a modern state-of-the-art design, an infrastructure that you wouldn't really expect to find in the former Eastern Bloc. Aspirations of becoming the motorcycle sport mecca of Europe, primarily for on-roaders, but of course also accommodating off-roaders. The ring was set up with motorcycle racing in mind. Lots and lots of crash space, and except for the start and finish straightaways, absolutely no crash barriers, just wide open space, so that if some of these road bikers and uh, road racers to be choose to bail off, they've just got loads and loads of room to fall in comfort without hitting anything nasty and hard. As a highlight of uh, this season, one of the rounds of the Pro Superbike Series is going to be held here in August. But first, former World Motocross Champion Heinz Skinnegander, 1984 and 1985 250cc World Motocross Champ, neighbouring Austria's only World Motocross Champion ever, set off-road up with the Pannonia Ring. He met with hearty support and got the OK to hold one of the, roads of, one of the rounds of the off-road challenge here. Here we are at 7am, lined up for a gruelling 12-hour enduro race to be started by Kinney himself. You can compete either with a partner or alone. The one to complete the most laps in 12 hours is the winner. And this is the most ridiculous Le Mans start you've ever seen. Forget about just sprinting across a strip of tarmac to your car or your motorbike. This is a 100-yard 100, 100 race through a ditch. So if you're not one of the first ones to your bike, then hard luck, you better just make sure you don't get run down. That tubby gentleman just crossing in front of us has obviously decided the best thing to do is get right up to the top end, so there's no danger of one of the early boys knocking him down. And there again, you see, you've got 12 hours to make up ground or die in the attempt. So we've got 450 riders, so it's pretty much, it's almost a western beach race, but without the sand. 450 riders from five countries, most of them, I'm glad to say, have the sense to be riding with a partner for the 12 hours. Four, and look at that in the mid-pack, 7 o'clock in the morning, the first thing you do is get brutally banzai off your bike. But uh, fortunately, the rider survived with only a few bruises and the shock of his life. 
48 of these guys, of these 450 guys, have chosen to go this distance alone. The course is actually 14.5 kilometers. That's nine miles round. And it's 100% off-road. And when we say off-road, boy, we mean off-road. This bit looks fairly smooth and kind as a sort of initiation ceremony. A lot of the riders here in Hungary are German. Certainly a lot of the faster ones are Germans. But of course we have Austrians, we have Hungarians. We have a huge mixture of bikes. A lot of, a lot of European ones. KTM's inevitably very popular being built in Austria. Husqvarna's, the wonderful little TM's from Italy. A mixture of four strokes and two strokes. In fact, each team has two machines. And some of them have actually mixed four stroke and two stroke between them. So you get teams who are one of whom will be on a four stroke bike and one on a two stroke of the same make. For example, KTM's or Skvarna's. Following that stretch through the woods, and here we are in some beautiful dead foliage, uh, the early riders come to uh, a sort of drainage canal which is draining water from the Pannonia ring. Now, it, it doesn't look too bad at this stage of proceedings, but you see, the problem is that 450 riders have to go through that, and they have to go through it quite a lot of times. There's a standard regulation here. There are no division into classes, absolutely no division into classes. Competition is open to anyone who wants to take part, as you can see from the way some guys are whipping around outside the ruts. You've got some fairly competent ones, as well as some, well, shall we say, lesser competent ones. And as that rut gets deeper, it's going to become a deeper and deeper problem. What started out as a harmless little stream is slowly but surely turning into a gigantic quagmire. Sabar is a resort known for its mineral hot springs and its mud baths. Well, I suppose a gesture of good hospitality and kindness is to invite one's guests to partake of an invigorated mud bath, if that's what you're famous for. Now, you may think that this guy's behaving a bit like a whip, but of course, motorcycles get to weigh... Mud is very, very heavy stuff. That motorbike may have, may have set out working, weighing about 250 kilos. It's probably twice that now. It's just incredibly heavy stuff when it's stuck all over your bike. So inevitably, in these sort of conditions, we're going to have victims. Now, how do you dig the front wheel out? It's bad enough getting the front, the back wheel buried, but when the front wheel goes in as well, that really hasn't got any drive of its own to help you. And rather cruelly, you'll notice the sunshine is sprinkling through the trees. Now, the leaders, as we emerge from the woods, Karl Heinz Holtz and Nico Klaus, they won the 12 hour Croatian event in Bouge. And uh, they're regular World Championship Enduro competitors, so they know what they're doing. Running in second, motocross duo, Thomas Ramsbacker and Thomas Gunter. And chasing them, ex-enduro champ Thomas Bieberbach and his partner Lars Non, followed by Christoph Siefert and Udo Grellmann. Unlike his partner Nico Klaus, Karl Heinz Holz is riding a two-stroke rather than four. Another difference between the two is that Karl Heinz Holz is noticeably heavier than his partner, which I suppose gives him an advantage with better traction. That bit extra weight over the back wheel. Mike Henning and Gun Gunnar Schellhorn. Also Germans, competing today for the first time in an off-road challenge event. Jörg Benk and Christian Pfeiffer, also from Germany. Pfeiffer, overall winner of last season's off-road challenge series, riding with Benk, and they're running in sixth place. The rider took a hard fall in a ditch earlier, and here we are at the back of the pack. This, the almost vertical slopes in this sort of uh, gravel pit, especially the exit, they look harmless enough and we could probably scramble up them on foot, but not for these guys. If you don't quite make it, you might as well never have bothered. It needs, it's going to need some delicate throttle control and someone demonstrates how to do it and someone demonstrates the flying V and dear old Heinz Kinnigadner. The great man himself has come to try and sort a bit of this out, give a bit of advice. Well, he was a good crasher in his heyday. Won two world championships. He's won, had some great rally victories as well. And here he is giving his expertise. I should think he'd been rather impressed with some of these crashes, Kitty. So 
sunshine still me <laughs> still meanly blinking down on some of these guys as they struggle well that's one way of doing it i would have thought you'd better off actually getting on the bike and having someone else pull it for you and another problem with sand of course whoops is if you go back which is a soft landing but if you start burying that back wheel and another lovely neat little flying oh and they're obviously a stage act they've been practicing this as a double <laughs> as a double act i don't think it's advisable to start until the man above has definitely got himself over the top and gently back again it must be very aggravating when someone sails past you like that right ktm firing himself up again Oh, and managing a, almost managing a 360, but not quite, laying it down for the camera. <laughs> this is great stuff. This is how not to use the throttle on, a, on a, um, an enduro bike. There we are. You could just sit in the bottom and watch. Karl Heinz Holtz, Nico Klaus, still the leaders. And looking like they're liable to stay there as well. Cogging down a bit, locking up that back wheel as you come towards the ridge before dropping into this uh, fierce gravelly stuff. The standings at 10 o'clock. Karl-Heinz Holtz and Nico Klaus on the KTM leading. Burkhardt and Will on the Spanish Gas Gas. Henning and Shellhorn on another Austrian KTM duo. And out here on the open land, it must be great to get a bit of speed up and a great ditch cross crossing. That's where you really need to keep it wound up, or not as the case may be. And if you're very, very brave, you overtake across it. But only the bravest souls are going to keep the throttle nailed to get across that. Imagine how much time you're making up, even in 12 hours. Meanwhile, back in the mud hole. I don't think some guys are going to make it. In fact, already, already the headlightless ghost is propped up against a tree ever so neatly in the background. A motorcycle that isn't going to see any more action today. And there's a couple of more that definitely aren't. Well, someday someone's got to come back and get them. But when it's got about six inches of mud all over it, just the weight itself. And there we are. Once that back wheel starts to dig in, that's terrifying news. Now, somewhere in this mayhem, in fact, here is Nicky Lauda's son, Matthias, only 16 years old. He's teamed up with his, uh, his older brother, Lucas, and uh, he, th he actually thinks at this point that this KTM is boiling over and he doesn't really want to carry on. He feels that he's going to uh, wreck it, rather like some poor sucker has wrecked this gas gas, or rather drowned it. But in fact, Lucas manages to persuade his kid brother to keep going. And they survive. Oh, a little Husqvarna cemetery there. I hope there wasn't a motorcycle underneath that. And that's what you call a derailed chain with little chance of going back. The more that you rev it, of course, the deeper it sinks. That's the horrible thing about these quagmires. Well, you can just stand there and look at it, or you could just sit down and try and repair it. Oh, you could just have a chat with the neighbours, of which there are plenty as more and more. In fact, that's our friend number 79. Better still, <laughs> light auto cigarette, draw deeply and relax. It's not going to do your lungs any good, but, uh, you know, it probably helps you pass the time of day with your mates. A pause for thought and a chat. If we never get out of here again, at least we're having a pleasant sig. All you need now are beers, really, boys. Der hängt bis zur Axt, aber den Dreh ist rack gar nicht mehr. Back in the gravel pit, of course. Problems of a different kind. It may not be wet, but it still does uh, cause a lot of entertainment, especially from Kiddy, who's always uh, absolutely loved his motorsport and still does. Two World Motocross Championships, he survived. Oh, wonderful stuff. He's even survived cancer, still competes in rallies for KTM. And look at him. Trying to persuade those guys to get up there, use a different line. <laughs> not quite like that necessarily, that's not quite what I meant. 
Bravo, shouts Kitty, bravo. It doesn't matter how you get up there, just get up, just get up. Oh, and a bit of a scrotum bruiser there for number 83. But the thing is, he didn't make it to the top. It doesn't matter how you get over the top, obviously. <laughs> as long as you and your bike land on the top. And Kitty's getting himself in a dangerous position there. If I were him, he didn't, he, he used to. <laughs> and again, not waiting long enough, wait until the track is clear. If Kinney used to think we photographers got in dangerous positions, what the heck is he doing now? <laughs> it's no good sitting there nursing your hip, sunshine. You've got to get back on that beast and ride it. <laughs> and yet another example of just a little impatience there. And someone doing it for a little lengthy bike repair, probably having a good rest at the same time, I would imagine. Oh, and another beautiful, I mean, 10 out of 10 for style. There's some wonderful stuff here. If you're not sure, just now. Oh. <laughs> Hang on to that bike. Don't let it go back down. I don't want to have to do that again. And ditto. This is great stuff. Come back and enjoy more of this Hungarian nonsense in a few minutes. Welcome back to the forests of Hungary. This is Jack Bernigal and this is more action from this very entertaining first round of the 1997 Off-Road Challenge. 450 riders, 12 noon we've reached, that's five hours in. Some of the guys are understandably starting showing signs of exhaustion with still a mere seven hours left to go. The pace has steadied, the strategy has become um, not to lose your concentration and perhaps to manage to somehow eke out your uh, strength until the end. Of course, some have already given up as we've seen. The long trudge back to the start and finish area. For many, the mud hole was more than they could handle, but um, in fact, the mud hole has now been passed by. Coming up to the lap counting point, each team has an armband with an integrated chip so that um, the passing laps can be registered electronically, which is pretty sophisticated stuff. But as I was saying, Heinz Kinnigardner has decided to take pity on the riders, detoured the traffic round that appalling mud hole. And about halfway through the race, I think the riders are beginning to feel a bit happier and more relaxed about it, especially as they, if they take their break and let their mate go off and do the riding for them. Pity the poor blighters are doing the 12 hours. and a nice little Rastafarian touch there. Pity the people who are doing the 12 hours on their own. The fastest teams have already completed 150 miles, around 250 kilometers. And while their partner's cranking out the laps, the riders in the pits can take advantage. And here's Matthias Lauda heading off for his for his stint. And this leaves the, uh, the door of their van open for, um, for Lucas Lauda to have a chat to the lady in the leather beat-up leather jacket. This is the first round of the off-road challenge and amongst those competing are Lucas and Matthias Lauda. Now, how, how do things look? What uh, young Lauda is telling is that in the first half we lost three hours because the bike broke down. We were only able to ride for two of them. In the meantime, we have been able to recover two hours, so we're just hoping to finish and if possible make it among the top 50. Now the ladies counters. Your brother mentioned earlier that he's been getting minor cramps. You put your feet up too. Is it perhaps for lack of practice? Lauda says yes, definitely. We haven't put in enough riding time and therefore we lack the practice and endurance. You really have put in much more practice time, have to put in much more practice time if you want to be in the running. And Heinz Kinnigartner told the lady earlier that uh, you two have been riding motocross for a long time and this is your first long enduro race. Do you want to start riding enduro professionally? Lauda, not surprised. He says no, this is really just a sort of after school hobby. In order to do this professionally, you have to invest much more time and effort. And then the Killer question, do you get support from your parents? Including one of whom, of course, is the staggeringly wealthy multi-world Grand Prix Formula One motor racing champion. No, says Lauda Jr. They help us out a little financially and the bikes are from them, but otherwise we have to get to the races on our own, be our own mechanics, do everything ourselves. And since we don't have our driver's licenses yet, we always have to find someone to drive us to the races. But things will be different as soon as I get my license. Thank you, Lucas. And we're going to try to talk to Matthias when he gets back. So they have to uh, find their own way there and do their own mechanics work. Obviously, Nicky's a busy boy and can't uh, afford the time. 
Standings at 2 p.m. Karl Heinz Holtz and Nico Klaus still in there. 15 minutes ahead of Burkhard and Will on the Gas Gas. Ramsbacher and Gunter on the Husqvarna in third place. So sorry, it's an all European domination of proceedings at the moment. Austria and Spain and Italy at the front. So the KTM of Holtz and Klaus leading. The TMs of Burkhardt and Bill. And then the, the originally Swedish Husqvarna, now owned by the, Aust the Italian Kajiva concern, in third place. KTM's fourth and fifth. Not a Japanese manufacturer in sight. And although there are five long and arduous hours left to go, the riders are giving it all they've got. You sometimes wonder why they do this to themselves, don't you, without a sort of uh, a cheering crowd and, and, and charming Marlborough girls to, uh, to welcome them home. But really, it's just the sheer satisfaction of enjoying yourself out on the bike. All that time in a saddle is what I, enduro riders love. Just having time on the bike and all those tales to tell afterwards. But look at this. This is five o'clock in the afternoon. Exhaustion beginning to set in. And the relief pit becomes a, a rather entertaining spectacle of solace and sound sleep, even in the upright position. He could probably sleep on his motorcycle. It looks like that guy's trying to. <laughs> then you have the problem of keeping warm. Or perhaps you could simply sit and meditate. Here we see how the chip is passed from one partner to another. One ride while the other waits in the service pit. Still his partner returns. And we're back with the, uh, the kid louder brother, Matthias. Matthias, you've just finished riding two laps. How do you feel? Louder, little junior, mini louder, says it's so incredibly tiring. My arms are all tweaked out. You have to be insane to want to ride 12 hours straight. It's brutal. Your brother told me that he was ready to flip out at the beginning of the race because you wanted to give up. What was wrong? I thought the bike had broken down because the radiator was leaking and I just didn't want it to get wrecked completely, confesses Lucas. But you can't take things too seriously. It's just a race for fun. You are 16 years old. How long have you been doing this? I've been riding motocross for three or four years, he replies. I started riding a motorbike when I was nine. At first I just rolled around on fields, but I didn't start serious motocross until three years ago. Heinz Kindergarten came here with you. Is he a sort of a role model for you? Lauda, definitely. He was world motocross champ. Is that one of your goals? It would be cool if it were possible, but I think I'll stick to just riding as a hobby. No, I don't think so. So there's a very honest 16-year-old son of a very famous father. He doesn't want to do this professionally, thanks very much. Two more hours left to go, of the 450 riders at the start, a good 90% are still hanging in there, even if occasionally a bit throttle-happy and still bailing off. Weaving their way through the woods, a little more carefully than uh, perhaps earlier in the uh, proceedings. So it sort of seems to be a little more throttle control has come into play as well. People seem to be, whoops, so people seem to be managing to get out of the, uh, the gravel pit a little more straightforwardly after the heroics of earlier. Mike Henning, Gunnar Shelbourne, still running in fifth place. Mike Burkhardt and Frank Veal have dropped down to fourth due to a technical defect. This certainly looks to be hurrying through the dust pretty impressively here. Number 60 running in third, Christoph Seifert and Udo Grellmann. The splendid bark of the four-stroke KTM. Number 60 running third there again, Seifert Grellmann. And the motocross team of Thomas Ramsbacher and Thomas Gunter has caught up a lot of ground. At first they made the mistake of riding too much motocross and made a lot of mistakes, but now they've changed tactics a bit. Cooled it back, rolled the throttle back a bit. Ramsbacher has been riding motocross since 1990 with occasional participation in Grand Prix. This year he retired from motocross. He doesn't want any more of the pressure of it. He just wants to do what makes him happy, which is apparently this. Thomas Gunter has been racing motocross since 1991. He also competes in downhill mountain bike races, and right now the two of them are running in second on their four-stroke Husqvarna's. But the leaders, Karl Heinz Holtz, Nico Klaus, still in there, two long-time World Enduro Championship riders. Like in the last 12-hour race in Bruges in Croatia, both have been riding at a very constant pace. 
Karl Heinz Holz has always been good on special stages in the many years he's been riding World Enduro Championships. And incidentally, he, this year he's not competing in the World Enduro Series. Klaus, not only an Enduro rider, but also an excellent trials rider. It's no surprise that neither one is having any difficulties on this course. And in addition, they have their own professional mechanic. And Heinz Kinnigatner flags in the winners. They come across the line together with a dramatic wheelie. The winners of the 12-hour Enduro Pannonia Ring of 1997, Karl Heinz Holz and Nico Klaus. A total of 40 laps, a distance of 360 miles. And justifiably congratulating one another. Well done, you guys. Second place goes to Thomas Ramsbacker. He's delighted with that. The first time the Ramsbacker Gunter team have tried anything quite as extraordinary as this. The best one-man team was Norbert Lichtenberg. He stuck it out till the end and completed 34 laps. That's not bad, only six less than the winner. Next best was Jan Giesler with 32. The best woman rider was Barbara Kennedy, who with her partner ended up in 57th position with 31 laps. And the Lauda brothers, they were 147th. So there's about to be a degree of dissatisfaction there, especially with their dad, I should think. Next year, same weekend, we've already got the second edition of the 12-hour race planned for Saturday, but on a modified course. And in addition, on the same weekend, there will be a gigantic off-road festival. A long day, which, may, whichever way you look at it, will last even longer than the enjoyable 12 hours that have seen Holtz, seen Holtz and Klaus win on the KTM. Rausback a good to second on the Spana, Seifert Grelman third on KTM, followed by Burkhardt and Ville on the Gas Gas. So a thoroughly splendid European result there. Join us again for some exciting action in a few moments. And now we bring you our preview of the Ersberg Mountain. This classic event, and it is some mountain, this classic event going into its third year. On Friday, Pikes Peak, where you can ride any type of motorbike you want. The course is straight to the top on wide gravel paths. That's the 15th, 16th of August. The following day, the notorious Hard Enduro, where just to get to the top is an honor in itself. The event limited to 500 riders. Information you can fax this Austrian number 4301522034. Sunday, all those who can still sit on, on a bike can compete in a World Superbike Championship round on the A1 ring in Spielberg just for fun. Off Road Magazine will be covering this event at Ersberg. But meantime, we move on to Hockenheim, where 27,000 spectators are in a party mood. Partly because the Superbike World Championships are here, but for sure because the wild guys of the German Super Motor Championships are in town. And these guys really do take it to the limit, sometimes beyond, and provide some great, great spectacle and real showmanship. The German International Championship features not just German guys, but top Frenchmen and others as well. So it's a tremendous carnival atmosphere here in Hockenheim. Supermoto style on tarmac and off-road. This is the sort of style you get from these uh, modified... <laughs> I was going to say these modified bikes on the limit, sometimes beyond it. Number one. Former motocross and supercross champion, reigning supermoto king Harold Ott. Number two, one of the one of the uh, one of the noisy men, Mike Michael Apple. And number five, twenty-year-old Boris Chambon, kid brother of the equally fine and tiny former French champion Stefan Chambon. Four-stroke motors are the better choice on tight tracks. Generally speaking, two-stroke motors are preferred for the faster tracks. That's the four-stroke Honda, sorry, four-stroke Husqvarna and the two-stroke Honda. But all of them are looked after with loving care. This is Klaus Kinnigadner, kid brother of Heinz, himself a former Grand Prix motocrosser. He says he favours the smooth power of the four-stroke motors. Two-strokes are much harder to control. He rides a KTM Duke. 
typical for Supermoto are the tyres, 17 inch wheels with roll tyres, racing rain tyres in the front, slick tyres on the rear wheel, which are cut after the rider's choice to suit track conditions. This is last year's runner for the championship, Mike Appel. Every rider uses his own profile pattern, he says. Here in Hockenheim, I groove them heavily because of the soft sand in the off-road section. The left side of the tyres remain ungrooved because all the tarmac turns at Hockenheim for us are left-handers. Tyre choice is critical at Hockenheim. It's 20% off-road, 80% tarmac. That's the characteristic of this track as we prepare for the start of the first race. And it's 20-year-old Frenchman Boris Chambon who enters the off-road section ahead of Ott and number four, his fellow Frenchman Gilles Salvador. And the rest of the 35 men starting field. And the heat is already on as Tony Sedlacek on his Sarholz Honda collides with Apple who responds with almost instant spite to a roar from the crowd. In front, Shambong is leading, absolutely sideways on the Husky, followed by Harold Ott, who is being stirred to use, using his, uh, losing his customary calmness. The fight of the concepts is on, two-stroke Honda versus four-stroke Husqvarna. Shambong's four-stroke Husky in the lead at the moment, with number one, Harold Ott's Honda right there, and Gilles Salvador on the uh, very popular all-round road and trail bike, the KTM Duke right in there behind them. Number three, Arkin Trickner, who is actually nursing a severe knee injury. This is some way to nurse it. As the race is nearly over, Shambong still in the lead. Rider number nine, Bert Gouch, he lines in 12th position. Harold Ott powers his favourite on his CC Honda into second place. Mike Apple through lapped riders up into third position past former Guidon Door star Gilles Salvador. And this is a celebrating victory, Boris Shambong style, or should I say, family Shambong style. The stood up wheelie that he's learned from his big little brother Stefan, echoing the latter's win in the 1991 Guidon Door. Brilliant stuff, the crowd absolutely love it. And the donut, this was another speciality of Stefan Shambong's, which his kid brother has picked up for the crowd's joy. And here's Apple, not wanting to be left out. A superb front wheel stoppy. And Gilles Salvador also joins in the front with a few burnouts. Nothing like a bit of smoke. And a very brave boy, Boris Wright Pillion with Mike Apple. Very brave indeed. The crowd absolutely loving this. It's as good as the racing, if not better. And finally, I was about feeding them some Alpine stars just to... As, the problem is that if you want to get a pair, how do you manage to get both of them? Whoa, fight over that, fellas. So, Shambong wins race one from uh, Harold Ott and Mike Apple. So, the riders prepare for race two, and the fans do as well. They love this stuff. Here they're telling us that they, they love the sport, but they equally much enjoy the sheer spectacle of the show. Hardly surprising, even. <laughs> the Germans do love their biking, and this is a pretty good example of it. Especially when they've got some of these good French guys coming over. Gilles Salvador, who gave Eddie Lawson such a tremendously hard time in the, Guidon, the first ever Guidon d'Or in Paris in 1989. He's number four. But it's Shambong who gets away at the front, in fact, cutting inside Gilles Salvador. And it's Salvador who emerges the first lap leader, ahead of Harold Ott, who's also squeezed past Shambong's Husqvarna. And a briefly and rather terrifying view of the off-road stuff from the handlebar of Appel's green Kawasaki. And here's number one, Harold Ott, something of a veteran now. His motocross days a long way behind him. The rest of the pack heading from tarmac into that bumpy off-road section. Still nursing that bad knee. Obviously nurse, nursing it from some success. And number seven, Klaus Kinnigander in there on his KTM Duke. He's heading for fifth place. 
Apo taking a close look at his competitors and really getting the Kawasaki wound up to the limit. Notice he's no respect for the opposition, cutting right, squaring that one off, cutting right across Harold Ott's nose. Ott responding by uh, nailing the Honda and getting himself into all sorts of shapes. <laughs> but even Apple can't always find his way past back markers. At the front, Gilles Salvador, the neatest, trickest rider on the circuit on the KTM Duke. Trickner again. Number four, Gilles Salvador, ahead of Apple, apparently. But it turns out that Salvador had jumped the start. And to his considerable display, bless him, the French hardman gets docked five places. So it's Apple celebrating here with yet another front wheel stoppy, who gets first place in front of his home crowd. Well, that's pretty hard on Salvador, I must admit. I felt that as he didn't even make the whole shot for his, uh, for his starting technique, that seems a bit rotten. But he has to be content with sixth place, and it's Mike Apple. He is celebrating with his lady friend. Because Boris Chambon's Husky faded away with a broken spark club, Apple earns the overall win and the prize money and the accolades. But in the German Two Motor Championship, Gilles Salvador still leading, Harold on second, Mike Apple third. So it's going to be an exciting confrontation between the French and the German to come. In conclusion, on screen now, we'll be bringing up the numbers, our new numbers in Germany, where you can reach Off-Road Magazine Info Service. For anything concerning this programme, broadcast dates, programme themes, races and events, complaints, suggestions, compliments even. Well, these are the numbers, the telephone number and the fax number in Germany for you to reach us by. Next Off-Road Magazine programme will be on July the 25th at 9pm with the Hill Climbing Rasha event, the World Enduro Championship round from distant Brazil and raid rally action from Spain and Italy. This is Jack Bernicol. Thank you for your company. Join us for these, uh, this more spectacular off-road action. The muddy, the messy, the fast, the slow. But all of it, thoroughly, thoroughly entertaining stuff that comes about when you make man with two wheels and almost insuperable obstacles. We hope you've enjoyed this show. Join us here on Eurosport for more top-class off-road action next week. This is Jack Bernicle saying thanks for joining us. Bye for now.